Good morning, everybody. I trust you had an easier time reading through numbers than some of the other things. Um, so today we're on our fourth book of Torah, uh, the book of Numbers. I thought when I opened it up, it was just going to say like one, two, three. It, it didn't do that. Come on. So this is lesson number nine, growing as a nation in God. I'm not sure if you can see what this is behind the, the headline, the title here. Um, this, is a, this is a map of the camp. This is how they camped out. So here in the middle is the meeting tent. Um, opposite, uh, outside the gate here is the dwelling of Moses and Aaron and the Levites. And then you've got the 12 tribes marked out. Who's supposed to be where? Zebulun, Judah, um, Naphtali, I can't tell who that one is. Dan, Asher, Gad, Reuben, Simeon, uh, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, twelve tribes. Um, so that's just a map that I found of how they were laid out according to the scriptures. How they were laid out. So, like every birthday Wednesday, got back to that same camp. Yep, yep. It's just like football players after a, a, a play, they come back to their formation again. Yep. So they, um, yeah. So that's how they camped out every time. Okay. So the Book of Numbers draws its name from. Oh, first of all, we're gonna get some, we're gonna talk today about background, and then if you notice this pattern before we go into specifics. Um, it's an, it's an alternating pattern. Laws and then some narrative. Laws and then some narrative. Laws and then some narrative. And then appendix of laws again. So you've got, um, it's an alternating pattern. It's not just all straight laws. It's not just straight narrative. It's kind of everything mixed in together um, in several chapter chunks. So we're going to talk, we're going to go through those briefly today. But first I want to give you some background. So the Hebrew um, name for the book is Bamidbar. Bamidbar, Bamidbar, um, which translates into in the wilderness. And again, just like Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus, it comes from the very first words of the book. So in the, in the wilderness, what happened in the wilderness? The Greek or Latin is arithmoi, which is where we get the word arithmetic from. It's the manipulation of numbers. Or the Latin translation of arithmoi numeri, which means numbers, referring to the counting of the generations. Okay, so that's why we call it numbers in the, in, in the Latin tradition, the Greek tradition, but in the Hebrew tradition, it's named for the first words of the book, just like everything else has been so far. Okay, when we talk about authorship, it's mostly from the P source, the priestly source. So there is some older um, Yahwist and Elohist J and E sources in there. By the way, did you catch that Yahwist J? That goes back to the, the tradition coming from the Germans. And so that's why it has that J, that J instead of a Y. Um, some older J Yahwist and Elohist traditions, and also some addition of some later P sources. When's the P source? That's after they come back from the exile. So this is a, this is a text that has some older narratives from the Yahwist and the Elohist, but it also has the influence. And you saw that in that layout, law is num uh, narrative, law is narrative. So pretty much that narrative is coming from most of it. It's coming from the Yahwist and the Elohist, and the laws are coming mostly from the priestly tradition. Um, it's thought to be a simplification of the journey from Sinai around the Dead Sea and into Canaan. This book, Numbers, more than the rest of Torah, comes from various sources. Even within a particular passage, there seems to be a blending of ancient and post-exilic sources coming together. So this one was heavily redacted. There's an impressive word you can use. That means edited. Okay, how does it fit in with the rest of the scriptures? Um, Within the context of Torah, it's obviously in the Sinai pericope. So this is, this is Exodus and Leviticus. They're moving out now from Sinai, but the beginning of Numbers is still at Sinai, and then they're moving on from there. Um, it's, as I titled it, um, Growing as a People in God. So God has already called a family. That family has grown. He's building them into a nation. 
And now they're growing as a nation. What does it mean to grow as a nation in God? And that's what Numbers seems to be talking a lot about. Um, it's referred to in the New Testament for helping us understand Luke and Acts. St. Paul's letters to the Corinthians and the Romans. Again, Hebrews. So you see a lot of Hebrews because of the audience that the, the author was writing to. You have to really understand a lot of Torah to really understand Hebrews. Same with Matthew. It's very prevalent in the Gospel of Matthew. It's also prevalent or um, exists and referred to in the book, the letter of St. Jude and the uh, book of Revelation. And then finally, uh, the num book of Numbers as literature. So people are leaving Mount Sinai to head to the promised land. They have one major, huge obstacle in their way, themselves. They get in their way more than anybody else gets in their way from being settled in the promised land. Most of the plot of the narrative in Numbers comes from various rebellions against God. So we're going to see a lot of rebellions. Um, it, but that shouldn't surprise us. We saw a lot of rebellion in Exodus. We saw hints of it in Leviticus. And now we're going to see much more of it again in Numbers. There's a series of struggles against the inhabitants of the land. They're going to fight against the Edomites, the Amorites, and the Midianites. Okay? And we'll get to that in a minute. The purpose seems to be to give an ancient foundation to a post-exilic ritual. Let me say that again. To give ancient foundations to a post-exilic ritual. So, they're establishing this ritual when they come back in the 6th century B.C., but they want to convince the people that this is important. It's so important that our ancestors did this, and they received this from God. So it seems to be they're interjecting some of the ritual law from later back into Numbers to give it a root in, um, in our identity as a people. Okay, That's going to be very important again next week when you read Deuteronomy, this whole identity of a people that we're special, we're set apart. doesn't mean we're better or worse, but we are set apart. And so... We need to show that because our people set apart, from the very beginning of God setting us apart, God called us to be different than everybody else. So it's not an attempt at a deception. What it is is an attempt at saying, this has always been part of God's will. Um, God has a desire to bring his people to the promised land, but they're not there yet. Um, who are the major protagonists? Of course, the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord speaks, the Lord acts. The Lord says he's a victim of others' negative actions. He, he suffers because of the actions of other people. He gives detailed instructions, as we've seen in Exodus and Leviticus already. He sets the Levites apart as a buffer between him and his people. Okay? Um, which is not unusual for God. Moses, ha Moses is the second mo most important character in this book. He has God's spirit on him. We've seen him already as being the sole mediator. Um, God has put his spirit on him. He's been changed by the encounter face to face with God. He shares that spirit though now with others. He carries out God's commands and he continues as mediator. And then Aaron, Aaron, the brother of Moses is the other is the third main character in this book. Um, and Aaron is shown in positive and negative lights. And we're going to, we've seen that already and we're going to see more of that still. There's the people uh, there's a word kahal in Hebrew. This is people coming together in response to a summons. We say at, uh, in the Eucharistic prayer at Mass, one of the Eucharistic prayers, it says, the people you have summoned. Um, God is summoning them to, get, to come together to form a people. And so there's a special word for that in Hebrew. Sometimes they also use the word eda, which means reprehensible, the reprehensible ones. Why are they reprehensible? Because they're being disobedient and unfaithful to God. And sometimes they're just called the word am, A-M, not am, but am in Hebrew, which um, is literally translated into people or kinfolk. Okay, so th those are three different words that are used for the people. The Israelites is the same thing as the assembly. The children of Israel, again, are seen in a negative light in numbers uh, where the word Israel, the children of Israel shown in a negative light. The word of Israel is shown in a positive light. So you might want to watch that as you reread that, if you reread that, um, to see that how the children of Israel is used in the text versus how the word Israel itself is used in the text. There's the 70 elders. That's those people who receive some of the Spirit of God that was put on Moses. 
There's the Canaanites, and you're going to see this again in, De in um, Deuteronomy. The Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan River, whereas the Moabites live in the mountains. Okay? So the Canaanites live by the sea. Um, there, we also hear about the Amalekites and the Edomites. Remember, in some of these cases, the Am Amalekites are the family of Amalek. That's why they're called the Amalekites, just like the Israelites are the family of Israel, Jacob. The Edomites, remember, does anybody remember who the Edomites are the family of? I heard it. Somebody said it. Esau. Remember who Esau is? The brother of Jacob. So he's not part of Israel, and his descendants are not part of Israel, but they're kinfolk to Israel. Okay, And sometimes that works out well for them, and sometimes it doesn't. We also see Joshua, who, be, who was first introduced to us as a faithful successor to Moses, and Caleb, the Lord's faithful servant. Miriam shows up again, who remembers Moses' sister. Eleazar, the son of Aaron, who becomes a priest. Uh, and Phinehas, who is Aaron's grandson, who intercedes on behalf of the Israelites. So we see other family members and other individuals that are being introduced. And then the Levites, those are the people who belong to the Lord. They're separate. They're sacred. So pretty much as I've come across it in Torah, the word holy is not associated with what we Christians usually define the word holy as, perfection and charity. It's much more affiliated with the word that we use for sacred, something that's set apart for God. Okay. So when you hear holy in Torah, even though I say it over and over again at Mass, that holiness is perfection and charity, it is. And that's a further development of the understanding of holy. But for them, it's not so much associated with charity. It's much more associated with the idea of being set apart, the way we would use the word sacred. Okay? Um, all right, so that's the main characters. Now let's get into the text. So in chapters 1 through 10, we have... This is 154. I lost track of my slides. Yeah, I think it is. No, it's 153. Okay, so we have, in chapter 10, we have these things that we're going to talk about. The first one is the census and organization. So it begins with a census, hence numbers, right? The counting of the generations. The counting of generations could mean grandfather, father, son, so, you know, and so on. But generations could also be the count of those generated by. So if we say the, the generations of Israel, these are the ones that are generated by Israel. So not just Jacob himself, but Jacob's sons and their sons and so on. So it's a count of the people generated by Israel. It's, we don't tend to use that word in our times that way, uh, but it does mean that as well. So in chapters um, 1 through 4, we have the census and organization. I, get, I have another drawing here of what we showed in that first picture, uh, the layout of the 12 tribes around the tabernacle. So if you notice, you can barely tell here, but this, see how this box here is a little bit closer to this wall than it is to this wall? This is the back wall of the, of the dwelling area. This is the entrance to the tent up here. This is the entrance to the dwelling area. So who's camped right across from it? Moses and the priests. So Moses' family, Aaron's family, the, Le the priests and the Levites, they're camped out here, right opposite the door to the meeting tent area. Okay? Um, and then you have Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Reuben, Simeon, Gad, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Um, that counts 12 tribes. Remember, Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was Joseph. There's no Joseph up there. But there is Benjamin and Manasseh. Those are the two sons of Joseph. So now that would make it 13, right? So who, do, who else doesn't have one up there? Who doesn't have one of these camps? Which son of Jacob? Levi. So remember, Levi was one of the sons, or Levi was one of the sons of Jacob. So, so where Je Le Levi doesn't have a tent, and you're going to see later they don't get a land, but Benjamin and Manasseh each get a portion 
um, which all these, so the actual Benjamin, these are, so when I say Benjamin Manasseh, you know Benjamin's dead, right? Okay, all these guys whose names are dead for a couple generations now, okay? These are the Benjaminites, the Manassehites, the Ephraimites. These are the descendants of Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh, okay? Because the actual, remember, they were all lived before Moses was born. They're all long dead, okay? But these are their descendants. But they're still called by the name of their tribal leader, the son of Jacob, the son of Israel, okay? Because Joseph was the favorite of Jacob. So Jacob, Joseph is special among the 12 sons. And so Jacob, Joseph doesn't have his own, but his two sons each have a portion. So the Benjaminites and the Manassehites are considered equal to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the Levites, not the Levites, but the Judahites and, and the rest. So because he was special. He had that fancy coat. <laughs> no, it wasn't because of the coat. Um, so the census is taken for creating four regiments of three tribes each. Regiments, these are groups of people that are going to be soldiers to defend them, okay, and to carry out what God wants carried out with regards to other nations. So they're camped by, by the way that they're creating these four different regiments. Um, chapter, this section also clarifies the difference between priests and the Levites. Um, the priests, as they're referred to now, are the sons of Aaron, they're preeminent. Now, remember what tribe Aaron belongs to, the Levites. He's a Levite, just like Moses, his brother, is a Levite, okay? But not all Levites are priests, and not, but all priests are Levites. So the priests are the descendants of Aaron, okay? That's a small group within the clan or the tribe of the Levites, okay? So there's a distinction between the priests and the Levites, all of the priests, because they're descendants of Levi, because they're descendants of Aaron, are Levites by tribe. But they're set apart as priests from the rest of the Levites. And the Levites are all separate apart from the rest of the 12 tribes. Okay? So there's priests and there's Levites. All priests are Levites. But not every Levite is a priest. Okay? Um... The layout of the camp and the order of the march is discussed. And the second census then is done of the Levite tribe itself to see who could be active servants for the sanctuary. So the Levites do have a role in the sanctuary. They don't have the same role as the priests, and they certainly don't have the same role as the high priest. But they do have a role in caring for the sanctuary. And so they have to take a census to find out how many of them there are, which of them are eligible to be, Ministers which don't have birth defects or blemishes and all those kinds of things we talked about last time in Leviticus, right? So, so there is a second census in this section, specifically of the Levites. Um, the Levites encircle the holy objects to protect the outer lay tribes. To protect the outer lay tribes. Remember we saw what happened last time when somebody dared to touch the Ark of the Covenant? Right? So the Levites form a circle around the sacred things to protect the lay people from coming into contact with the holy objects. The um, Aaronids, that's how you actually refer to them in English, the descendants of Aaron, do the same. They form an even inner circle inside the Levites, right up against the sacred objects. So you have the, you have the Ark of the Covenant, and then right around it you have the Aaronids, the sons of Aaron, the priests, and then around that you have the Levites, and then you have all the rest of the tribes around that. And it's for the protection of the people. Okay, chapter, that's one through four. Um, in five and six, you have the purity of the camp and the community. Um, there's the exclusion of the impure. So again, we heard about some of this already in Leviticus. People with skin diseases, people with ritual uncleanliness, people with discharges, a corpse. Those are all things that are impure. And so it talks about, in chapter 5, the exclusion of things impure from the community. Um, how to restore and maintain purity and order. So if somebody becomes unclean, how do you restore them to cleanliness? So now, remember, we went from narrative. Now we're into some laws, right? The ritual test for women guilty of adultery. You know what that reminded me of if, when you read that? It reminded, the Salem witch trials. 
That's what, that's what it reminded me of. And I wouldn't be surprised if those people at Salem didn't somehow take their ideas somehow from the scriptures here. Um, the Nazarite vow, we're going to see that again with, um, certainly with Samson, who was a Nazarite. If you read the book of Judges, you'll see it, you'll, Samson's whole story. He was a Nazarite. John the Baptist was more like, most likely a Nazarite. The interesting thing is the word Nazarite and the word Nazorean sound very similar to us, but they're very different things. A Nazarite is somebody who took this vow that was described in this chapter. A Nazorean is a person from Nazareth, like Jesus, okay? Jesus the Nazarean, okay? Not Jesus the Nazarite. Two different things, okay? Now, there's people who argue that Jesus might have made a Nazarite vow, but that's not why he's called Jesus the Nazarean. He's called Jesus the Nazarean because he's from Nazareth. Uh, and then you have the, the very end. It might have sounded familiar to you. The ironic, ironic, or priestly blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with kindness and give you peace. That's still in our missile. And every once in a while, I use that at the end of Mass. Um, there's one of the solemn blessings. When I say bow down for the blessing, or the deacon says bow down for the blessing, and I put my hands out. One of those blessings is the Aaronic blessing. Um, it, in the Aaronic blessing, we say, may the Lord bless and keep you. They would actually say, may Yahweh bless and keep you. So they wouldn't use Adonai. They would use the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. That's why only the priest, only the priest, not even the Levites, only the priest could give that blessing because they were the only ones allowed to pronounce the sacred name. Because if anybody else pronounced the sacred name, it would be a blasphemy. Okay? So it's, um, that's, that's one of the reasons why we don't say, may Yahweh bless and keep you at Mass. We say, may the Lord bless and keep you, may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Um, so that, that priestly blessing over 3,000 years later is still being used by the descendants, the spiritual descendants of Israel. Um, chapters 7 through 10, we have cultic rules for a departing Sinai. So remember we said at the end of Leviticus that they're getting ready to leave Sinai. So in the beginning of Numbers, they're getting ready to leave Sinai. So Sinai is no longer the place where they encounter God, they now have a portable Sinai, if you will, the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the people encounter God. Okay? So they have some rules for doing that. The dedication on the first day, the first month of the second year. So they were camped at Sinai for two years. This dedication happens on the first day of the first month in the second year at Sinai. There was offerings from tribal representatives. The lampstand is dedicated, cared for by Aaron and his sons. Why Aaron and his sons? Because those are the priests. Those are the ones who were regularly going into the outer area of the dwelling tent. Not the inner area of the dwelling tent, the Holy of Holies, but the outer area where the lampstand is, the altar of, sacri uh, the altar of incense, and the table of the showbread. Okay? So they, they dedicate and care for the lampstand. We have our own version of that here. It's called the sanctuary lamp. Uh, it indicates to us the presence of God in the Eucharist. Uh, the purification of the, of the Levites now happens. Remember, we had the ordination of the priests in Leviticus. Now we have the um, purification of the Levites, similar to the ordination, but no laying on of hands. So they're not ordained priests like the, one, the sons of Aaron, but they are separated, they are purified for the work that they have to do. And then this whole day, idea of a second Passover, did you catch that? I never heard about this before. This was something new for me. So if for some reason you're impure, ritually unclean, to celebrate the Passover on the 14th day of Nisan, the 14th day of the first month, when they remember the Passover and the Exodus, if you're ritually unclean, you can't partake in it. But presumably, if you're going through repurification, 30 days later, you will be clean. So 30 days after Passover, there's a second Passover, for the people who couldn't celebrate the first time. Okay? But there's a huge prohibition in there. If you abuse this, you're excommunicated. 
So if you just say, well, I'm just gonna do whatever I want, I'll just go through purification 30 days after I do whatever I wanted to do, and then I can go celebrate the Passover on the second Passover day, and I think I'll just do that every year and then I can do whatever I want. There's an, it says in there, if it's abused, the person is to be excommunicated. And then we heard the cloud again. Remember the cloud? When the cloud uh, signifies the presence of the Lord, when the cloud lifts from the tent, that means the Lord is moving on and you better break camp and follow him. Okay. And there's a whole trumpets thing for communication. Talk about this kind of trumpet for communication for God and this kind of trumpet blast for communication among the people to let them know it's time to move. And so they talk about those trumpet blasts. So again, ritual rules. When I say cultic, I don't mean cult like people who kidnap your children and you know try and brainwash them. I'm talking about literally cult, um, ritual practices. That's what, that's what cultic means. Okay. Um, next slide. Okay, so now we're leaving Sinai. So chapters 10 through 14 give us a narrative of what happens to people as they go from Sinai to Paran and the battle for Canaan. Okay, so chapters 10 through 12, they're journeying, they're departing Sinai following the cloud. This is where we get some of the stories that we're, we're kind of familiar with. Um, Moses feels overwhelmed. There's a lot of people, thousands of people, and they're all coming to him with all his stuff. Remember, his father-in-law said, you're not dealing wisely. You need to have the, the bigger things brought to you and the smaller things brought to other people. So he establishes the 70 elders. Somebody else had 72 disciples. Who was that? Yeah, that's him. Um, so Moses, God calls for the 70 elders. Two of them aren't. Um, outside the camp at the dwelling tent to receive the spirit. Eldad and Medad, they're still in the camp. But because God wants them to receive the spirit too, even though they're in the camp, they get the spirit and they start doing what people do when they get the spirit. They start prophesying, speaking for God. And somebody says, hey, they got to cut it out. They're speaking for God. And Moses is like, no, that God gave them part of his spirit and they're supposed to speak for God too. Um, then the people are whining again. Um, all we have is this quail to eat. Give us some meat. Back when we were in Egypt, and we had it real good in Egypt. We had meat to eat. Now we don't have meat. So who's going to intervene, mediate for them with God? Moses. But Moses himself even doubts when he talks to God. But the quail is given in a super abundance. I love that expression. They're going to get so much of it, it's going to come out of their nostrils. Um, and there's an, so the people rebel. Moses doubts. God gives what's needed. And then there's more rebellion. This time in Moses' own family, Aaron and Miriam, his brother and his sister. <coughs> they get a little uppity. And they say, well, how come Moses gets to be the mediator and gets to have all this power and everything? We're his sister and his brother. We should have it too. And so they try to take on the role that's exclusive to Moses. They don't ask for it in their conceit. They just assume it. They start assuming the responsibility and the role. Um, and we heard that Mary, Miriam is struck leprous for that. Aaron repents. Where did we see that before? Exodus, right? With the golden calf. Uh, people are destroyed, but not Aaron. Aaron repents. Um, and then God heals Miriam as well. So that's chapters 10 through 14 in a very brief nutshell. Um, chapters 13 and 14 of this section, they're at the threshold of the promised land. So remember the time frame now. It's been two years since they left Egypt. Okay. They're on the edge of the promised land. The place that they're going, the place that God is leading them to with the cloud, the place that God has promised them, right? So they send people to go check it out. There's people living there. Can we take this land from them? Are we strong enough? Are we strong enough to take what God is giving to us? They get, come back with a difficult report, and the people doubt that God will give the land. So once again, they're testing God. Some wanted to go back to Egypt, that wonderful place where we had everything we needed. Joshua, Joshua now, first time we see Joshua acting, Joshua exhorts them to faithfulness. 
Look what God has done for you. And you're going to doubt him. God is angered. And who goes to mediate again? Moses. Um, Moses appeals a God to God's vanity. Just like he did before. Remember what his argument was? Don't destroy the people because people will talk bad about you. Not because they deserve it, but because people talk about you. He couldn't do this, or he brought them out there just to kill them. So now he says this again. If you, if you do destroy them, they, all those other nations out there will say, their God wasn't strong enough to do it. So if you don't bring them to the promised land, even though they're sinning against you, people will say it's because you weren't powerful enough to bring them into the promised land. So God says, I will not destroy them, but not one of those people that I brought out of Egypt will get to settle in the promised land. So they're knocking on the door after two years. And God says, because you doubted me again, none of you who I brought out of Egypt will get to settle in the promised land. And so they wander now in the desert for 40 years. Okay? That's where that whole 40 years of wandering in the desert comes from. It's a response to their doubting that God can bring them. God who did the 10 plagues, God who parted the Red Sea, God who gave them the law, God who gave them the, the water from the, in the desert, God who gave them the, the manna, God who gave them the quail, God who has done everything he possibly can for them, everything they've needed, and they still doubt. And so he says, okay, I'm not gonna, I'll keep my word. I will bring the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob into the promised land that I promised their ancestors. But none of you individual people who I brought out of Egypt are going to get to see it. That's chapter 13 and 14. Chapters 15 to 19, back to laws again, cultic ordinances. Um, that's chapter 15. Chapter 16 to 19, more revolts against God and Moses and the role of priests in the community. So this time we have this guy, Korah. Korah was a Levite. Okay, So he's part of that special tribe in God's eyes. He's part of the Levites. He and 250 people revolt against Moses. So do... Dathan and Abiram, who are Reubenites. Remember, Reuben was the tribe, the first son of Jacob. Okay? So now you have Levites and Reubenites rebelling against Moses. They accuse Moses of being uppity. And he accuses them of being uppity and taking on a role to themselves that's not theirs. God acts, and the ground opens up and swallows them to Sheol. This is an important word to understand. Sheol in Hebrew um, uh, philosophy is the place of the dead. For the Greeks, it's the same as the Greek idea of Hades. So all the souls go to Sheol, just like in the Greek mythology, all the souls go to Hades. That's different than Gehenna for the Jews, for the Hebrew people, or Tartarus in Greek mythology. Gehenna and Tartarus are the places of the damned. Okay, so these are not just the dead, but the, damp, the, the, da the dead who are to suffer for all eternity. So when you hear Sheol, Sheol gets translated into Latin as infernum, which gets translated into English as hell. But when we think of hell, we think of the place of the damned. Okay, that's not what's here. This is Sheol, the place of the dead. <clears throat> There's only two places where souls go after they leave this world. At this point in their religion, the place of the dead or the place of the damned. Okay, so they get swallowed up and they're taken to the place called Sheol, which is not hell the way we think of it. That's important, and I, I, I did that whole thing because... Every time you pray the Apostles' Creed, you say Jesus, after he died on the cross, he descended into hell. The hell there is from the Latin infernum, which is from the Greek Hades, which is from the Hebrew Sheol, not the place of the damned. 
So people always say, well, why would God, why would Jesus go to the place where the damned are? He didn't. <laughs> That's not what we mean by that. What we mean is the place of the dead, not the place of the damned. Okay? Um, Again, that's something really important in Christianity. So we have the dues of the priests and the Levites, this whole story about the red heifer and slaughtering the, the heifer as a sacrifice and the water of the purification for the priests. So that's all in chapter 16 through 19. Chapter 20 to 25 is more narrative. So now they've left Sinai. Okay. We said that they were heading to Paran, and now they're going to Moab, okay, the place of the Moabites. So they journey from Kadesh, which is the place where they demanded water and um, quail from the Lord. And they're heading to Moab in chapters 20 to 21. This is where we have the waters of Meribah. So now the people are complaining they have no water. Why did you make us leave Egypt? Wonderful, wonderful Egypt. Why did you make us leave there? God says to Moses, speak to the rock so that it will produce water for the people. Moses hears the command, takes his staff and strikes the rock, not once, but twice. Okay? This is, water comes out. Okay? But this is Moses' great sin. God didn't say strike the rock. God said speak to the rock. He wanted the word spoken to bring about his will. Moses doesn't listen to God. He does what he wants instead. And not just once, but twice. To make it very clear, he's not listening to God. He's doing what he wants. So Moses is told he too will not enter the promised land. He'll be one of those people that gets to wander around the desert for 40 years, but he won't get to go in either. The word Meribah itself has in it the root for contention. This is where the people contended with God. Okay. Um, I have a handout for you. Can you hand those out to everybody and just hold on to the extras? There's two Psalms of King David Remember, King David lives a couple hundred years after all of this. Two Psalms of King David that I thought would be important for this Bible study. The first one is Psalm 95. It talks about at Meribah and Massa, they were, they tested me and provoked me, although they had seen all of my works. So you can read that, read that Psalm, not in the light necessarily of being a Christian, but read that Psalm in the light of what you've studied in Torah. Okay? How would a person who's understood Torah understand this psalm, okay? That's Psalm 95. The other one is on the page of Psalm 136. Uh, by the way, Psalm 95, for those of you who are here on Friday mornings when we do morning prayer after Mass, we always start with the invitatory psalm. That's the psalm we say every, every Friday morning as, at the beginning of morning prayer, Psalm 95. Psalm 136 is sometimes called the Easter psalm. Of course, King David didn't write it as an Easter psalm because he lived a thousand years before Easter happened. Um, but it talks about salvation history. Much of what we've read in Torah is mentioned in Psalm 136. I keep saying 135. 135 and 136 are very, very similar psalms, but I gave you 136. Um, so sometimes go over that and read those psalms. Not right now, but read those psalms and read them, like I said, try to set aside a Christian understanding, because obviously they're very important for us as Christians as well. But just in the light of what you studied in Torah, Read through that and see what, what sense that makes to you, okay? Um, that's Meribah. They're asked to pass through Edom. We said Edom is the, where the descendants of Esau. They're denied passage through. So there's still that little bit of residual animosity, if you will, between the Israelites and the Edomites, between Isaac or between Israel and J uh, Jacob and Esau. There's still that little bit, kind of like, Certain nationalities that in Europe have fought each other for centuries, and they come here, they still have it, they bring the animosity with them against people who are basically the same tribe, the same kinsmen. But um, you see the same thing going on here. Um, Aaron can't enter because of sin, his sin at Meribah, so he's not allowed to go into the tent. 
So the role of Aaron is now passed to his son, Eleazar. So Aaron, too, is punished for his sin at Meribah, just as Moses is punished. So Aaron has to pass on the role of being the high priest to his son, Eleazar. And then Aaron dies, and he's mourned for 30 days. Okay? So the people of Israel mourn for Aaron, despite his weaknesses, despite his inadequacies. He is a great sign of repentance before God. And so they mourn him for 30 days. The king of Arad, one of the Canaanites, attacks Israel. God defends Israel, and the Aradites are destroyed. Guess what? They complain again. Who would have thought? So they complain in chapters 20 and 25. The people complain against God again, and God sends this time seraph serpents. Seraph. Seraph translates into fiery. The reason they're thought to be called fiery serpents because their bite causes a pain like burning, a burning sensation, a strong burning sensation. So they're seraph serpents. By the way, that's the same root as the word seraphim. Remember, I am in Hebrew means plural. So the seraphim are the fiery beings that are always around God. So we talk about cherubim and seraphim. The seraphim are fiery beings. That's what seraph means. They're fiery beings that are around the presence of God. Those that are bitten by the seraph serpents die. Moses, once again, intercedes for the people before God, and God relents. What does God tell him to do? It's in the picture right there. God tells him, establish a pole and put on the pole a bronze serpent. And as many as look at the bronze serpent will be healed. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but this is a big deal. This is called a sign or a prefiguring of Christ on the cross. Okay? What does the snake represent? The snake represents the seraph serpents, right? Who were the punishment for the sins of the people. So the ser serpent represents the sin of the people. Raised up on a pole... And as much as people participate in that image, they're healed. What is Christ? Christ is the sacrificial lamb that bears the sins of the people, raised up on a pole. And as many as participate in that sacrament, outward sign instituted by God to give grace, as many as participate in that sacrament are healed. Big, big prefiguring here right in Torah, of Jesus raised up on the cross. Okay? It's a very important passage um, in, in Torah for us as Christians. Uh, then you have, they're going through Transjordan. I think that's the previous side. Yeah, so down here, defeating Sihon and Og. You'll see them mentioned in the psalm that I gave you. Um, they defeat those people in um, Psalm 135, verse 11. That's also in Psalm 136. Okay, the next slide. You got thrown in here another narrative. I, I tried to make these pictures a little more clear, but I had to make the letters white in order to do that, because if they were black, they'd blend in. So here's, the, here's Balaam and the angel talking to the donkey. So we'll just call him Mr. Ed. So... So the angel is talking because Balaam is not wanting to listen at first. Balaam is called on by Balak. Balak is the king of the Moabites. He's afraid of the Israelites. He, even though the Israelites don't believe they're powerful with God on their side, Balak does. And he's afraid of what the Israelites are going to be doing on his border. So he sends for Balaam, a prophet, to curse the Israelites. In a series of going back and forth, Balaam and the Lord speak, and the Lord says, don't curse them. Balaam decides to go with Moab, but the donkey won't go, and the donkey talks to the angel. Eventually, Balaam is asked to bless the Israelites. He rejects Balak's directions, and God says, and there's a couple more going back and forth, 
And God says, bless the Israelites, and Balaam does. So that's the story of Balaam and Balak. Actually, it's Balaam. Because when you see two vowels together like that in Hebrew, you have to pronounce both of them. That's why it's not Israel, it's Israel in Hebrew. Balaam. If you see Baal in the readings that we have at Mass, where the people are worshiping the false god, when they get to Canaan, the false god's Baal. It's not Baal. It's not Baal. It's Baal. You have to pronounce both vowels. Um, Chapter, let's see, chapter 25. Yeah. Um, The people respond to God's intervention. They apostatize again at Baal. Baal Peor, chapter 25. So every time they get a chance, the people are turning their back on God. Isn't that wonderful? Um, Most of the time they repent, though, so that really is wonderful. Every single time they turn against God, God has, in his justice, has the right to destroy them. You turn your back on me, I turn back on God. I turn my back on you. And if God turned his back on any of us, we'd cease to exist. We'd cease to exist. So despite the fact they consistently turn their back on him, and in justice, he has every right to turn his back on them, he doesn't. That's the kind of God we have. No matter how many times we sin, if we repent, God will forgive. There must still be consequences to our sins because our sins hurt people, but God will forgive. Um, They apostatize again at Baal Peor. He says they can't be sexually active with the Moabite women and they can't worship Baal. Why? Why can't we intermarry? That's racist. God's racist. No. God set these people apart as his chosen people. If they marry somebody who's not part of the chosen people, they may turn their back on the covenant. And God doesn't want his people turning his back on the co- their, their backs on the covenant. So God says you can't marry the Moabite women because they because men aren't strong. Women are strong. And the men will give up their religion because of, a, of an attractive Moabite woman. So you can't marry the Moabite women. And you can't worship Baal, obviously, because he's a false god. And the guilty are terminated for doing so. Okay, chapters 26 to 30. More law section again. Uh, census, inheritance, vows, and sacrifices. They're preparing to, for the conquest of land. So chapters 25 to 30, they're preparing for the conquest of land. They're, they're, they've now come back to the promised land after 38 years, 40 years. And they're coming back to the promise, they're coming back to the promised land, getting ready to enter the promised land. So we did a big fast forward there. There's another census. You have to establish the relative size of each tribe after the rebellious generation has been destroyed. Why do we need to know how big each tribe is? Because we're going to start partialing out the land. We got to make sure that we give everybody enough, every tribe enough land for the number of people that they have. Okay, so there's a census needed. They throw in this here and then later on, this whole thing about Zelophehad, the daughters of Zelophehad. Women couldn't inherit property, okay? If they're married and they have no sons, they can have a lever rate here in their levy, Levi, a lever rate marriage in order to provide an heir. So a woman's husband dies, has no sons. She can marry um, a member of, of the Levite tribe, a member of the family to raise up sons so that she has somebody to take care of her, somebody to inherit the property. Okay, because women couldn't inherit property. As Moses is going to die before the promised land, he has to commission Joshua to take his place. So somebody has to take his place as the leader. But notice, unlike the relationship between Moses and Aaron, where Moses' role supersedes Aaron's role, even though Aaron's the high priest, the high priest now is over Joshua. So Joshua does not inherit Moses' absolute role in the community. There are priests now, and the priest has a higher role than Joshua has, although Joshua is the leader of the people. So it's kind of like what you've seen in every bit of history ever since then, um, the fighting, what's called the fighting of the two swords, the sword of religion and the sword of the state. 
in every culture you can pick, there's been a battle. Which sword is bigger and stronger? The sword of religion or the sword of the state? Um, does the religion, is the religious leader absolute? Like, uh, remember, most of us here are old enough to remember Ayatollah Khomeini in the early, late 70s. He became, they deposed the Shah of Iran. The Shah of Iran was not a religious leader. He was a political leader. He had the political sword. The Ayatollah had the spiritual sword. And we saw who won in that battle, at least initially, the Ayatollah. Okay. So every culture ever since then, the Pope used to have two swords, the sword of religion and the sword of state. He was a, he was a, he was a, a king. He was an emperor. He had lands. He was a, he was a ruler of lands. Um, now he just has the one sword, the sword of, of religion. Um, so they have this going on. The ritual calendar is reviewed again. Nothing really new there. Although you did see in the end of that section, the family Sabbath meal is now the center of the religion. And it really becomes and stays that way after the temple is destroyed in 70 AD in Jerusalem. It continues to this day. The real center of the Jewish religion today is not the synagogue. The synagogue is a reading study room. The center of the religion is in the family. The Shabbat, the Sabbath meal on Saturday night or Friday night, is the most important ritual in Judaism today because there's no temple. So all those sacrifices we read about in Leviticus, those are all done because there's no temple to offer them in. Um, and then it talks about vows by women. And so women uh, could make certain vows like for celibacy and things like that, but they're, they're, if their father knew about it within the same day or their husband knew about it in the same day, they could break the vow and, you know, it's... Um, it, it, and it sounds weird to us that that could happen, except if, if you remember, that woman couldn't provide for herself. So she was dependent upon her father or her husband to care for her. And so if they, made a, if they, if they went out and made a vow for themselves, they made it impossible for, for the father or the husband to care for the, the woman. They had a right that day, they had a right just that day to break the vow. After that day, they couldn't. Um, chapters 31 through 34. Oh, um, I got, I got another treat for you. Got another handout. This is a nice color map of what tribe got what land. So you'll have this, this map in your book of who gets what land. It's interesting, like Manasseh gets a huge area and gets East Manasseh and West Manasseh. Um, so it's, um, it's, all, it's all laid out there. For, but again, remember they did the census to find out how big each tribe was. So Manasseh must have been a huge tribe because they got an awful lot of land. Judah is very clearly a large tribe in the south. He gets a huge area of land, Judah. Um, so those are where, the, where they end up settling when they come into the promised land. Uh, there's the war against the Midianites. Do you remember who the famous Midianite was? The, the priest of Midian, uh, the sheik of Midian, the mother of Zipporah. I mean, the father of Zipporah. Zipporah was the wife of Moses. Moses' father-in-law was a Midianite. Okay. So Moses' father-in-law, Jethro or Reuel, whichever name you want to give him. So they're fighting against the Midianites because God said so. It's a retaliatory attack for the Baal Peor incident. So the second census is because they're talking about how much land will each tribe need. So let's say this particular family in the tribe of Judah had six daughters as opposed to another tribe where the, where the guy had only one child. So they need to make sure there's enough land to support the people of that family. Okay. Well, of course. Of course. 
for two reasons. One, men are the part are the partakers in the covenant, not women. Okay, so the men partake in the covenant. Second thing is men are responsible for caring for people, women aren't. So yes, so consistently, even to the days of the New Testament, 5,000 men he fed on the, on the hill that day, not including women and children. Okay, because the men are part of the covenant in a spiritual way, that's a spiritual reason, and then there's a practical reason. The men have to provide for everybody else. So yeah, so there, there definitely tends to be an, an emphasis on counting men. Um, Gad and Reuben are Transjordan, Transjordan. So Israel, Mediterranean Sea, Lebanon, Jordan, Jordan River separating Israel from Jordan. Um, down here, the, the Negev, the desert, and then the Red Sea and the Sinai Peninsula over here. Transjordan just simply means on the other side of the Jordan. Okay, the Jordan River. So in what we would today call the country of Jordan. Okay, so Transjordan just means on the other side of the Jordan River. So because they're coming in from this way, the Reubenites and the Gadites get land Transjordan. So they have to settle first because they're in their land. So they start settling. But the agreement is, yeah, we'll help you get settled here because we're in your area that you're going to get. But don't think you're off the hook for helping us, the other 10 tribes, when we, when we do battle for the lands on the other side of the Jordan River, what we would today call Israel. Okay? So Reubenites and Gadites settle first, Transjordan, in Numbers, in the book of Numbers. But they have the obligation as family to, as part of God's chosen people, to help the other 10 tribes settle their area as well. Um, and I think you can see it on your map where the Jordan River is. I think you can see there's Reubenites and Gadites on the other side of the Jordan River. So on the east side of the Jordan River, the good side. I don't know if it's the good side or bad side. Um, then we have a nice re retelling of what, what um, the desert itinerary. All the places that they went from when they left Ramses, remember the city that they left in Egypt, to Migdal, to Sinai, to Kadesh, to Edom, all the places that they were. There's a nice listing of where they went. Um, Aaron dies 40 years after leaving Egypt at 123 years old. So right, 40 years. So he gets to come to the edge of the promised land, but not allowed to go in. Um, they divide Canaan. They drive out the, the inhabitants of Canaan and destroy their gods and their high places. God says, I want you to do that because I have given you the land. They divide the land by population, which was the purpose of that second census. Um, who was the third one? Um, the Reubenites, the Gadites, the Ephraimites? Is that the other one on the other side, Transjordan? Reubenites, Gadites, I think it's Ephraim. Ephraim. No? There's a third one. Reubenites, Gadites, Manasseh, and Dan. Well, not, Dan, not really Dan, but Manasseh. So you see where the Jordan River is? So you see there's the Dead Sea, right? The big body of water in the middle there. That's the Dead Sea. Go up from there, there's a little body of water that's blue. That's the Sea of Galilee or the Lake Genesaret or about 16 other different names, Sea of Tiberias. The connecting line between those two bodies of water is the Jordan River. Okay? So you see that? Dead Sea right here, yeah. Galilee right there, connecting it. These two right here, the line connecting it. That's the Jordan River. So everything on this side, on that side of the Jordan River is called Transjordan. You guys all find it? Okay. Um, Aaron dies, John. Okay, and then finally, chapters 35 and 36 brings um, numbers to an end. We have a couple of laws for the promised land, and then we're revisiting that, that story of the daughter of Zelophehad and her, um, and her um, struggles with owning property. Okay. 
Um, here's the sheet for next week for Deuteronomy. And Chris, if I could ask you to put on the lights, you can go to your table discussion. <laughs>